Hello and welcome back to the test lab. My name is Dr. Watt, testing lights and your patience so you can make better sense of the array of options open to today's growers. Last time out, we looked at one-piece greenhouse style fixtures, but what about the other side of the DEHPS coin, the ballast and hood separates? Well, while it's unrealistic for us to test every viable combination in one go, we can test components if we have some controls to gauge changes against. And that's what we're doing today with this DEHPS bulb test. Like the single-ended test we ran back in episode 2, for this test we'll have a standardised hood and a standardised ballast to remove those variables. Before we get to the hood, let's look at the ballast. For this test, I picked a ballast that was recommended by the sales guys at Monster Gardens retail store. It's one of the top sellers both online and physically in the store. The power box. It also had a reputation for not coming back broken. This is something that makes salespeople very happy apparently. And it also means it should be able to take the heavy riggers of the sorts of tests I'm going to subject it to. The hood is a Radiant DE from Hydroform, and unlike the compact all-in-one fixtures from episode 5, it's designed for tents just like ours, or for 4x4 size benches. And because this hood was initially designed for tents or small surface areas, it hasn't been designed specifically for a light compounding light plan. It captures and focuses all the radiant energy and points it straight down. And that radiant energy includes a whole lot of heat. Initially, I felt a little confused as to why these hoods were so powerful. Why would anyone use the all-in-one units? Thankfully, the answer was easy to find, as I turned to Monster Garden's commercial supply sibling, Cultivation Supplies, who were happy to set things straight. You see, it's all about efficiency, really, and by that, we mean economic efficiency. When a grow gets beyond, say, 40 to 50 lights in scale, the sheer electrical cost of light becomes a massive burden, and anything that can be done to maintain or to improve the amount of output while decreasing cost inputs such as water, fertilizer, light, and power means money back into the business. In other words, more for your This law of proportional scaling i.e. the bigger the scale, the cheaper per unit its output, is the reason for massive manufacturing facilities all around the world. And it's no different in our industry. So when you're dealing with huge grow operations, you don't necessarily want the most powerful lights there are. You want them to be just powerful enough to produce the results you want, whilst using the least amount of electricity possible because electricity costs you money. This is why large grow operations turn to light compounding, and why, if you compare a greenhouse fixture versus hood and ballast separates in a test such as ours, it will always look a little bit feeble head to head, but conversely, if you compared how many lights it took to light up a set large area, you'd find the one piece style is far more efficient and can save a big operation a large amount of money. This is both in saved power and reduced need to remove the heat caused by lights. Light compounding is something I'll be going on to in greater detail in a future episode, but I wanted to include mention of it here to help avoid the misunderstanding that more power always equals a better option. Not if it's your money you're spending. So, we're using a standardised ballast in our power box and a standard hood in the Radiant DE. What bulbs are we going to be testing? Well, as always, we grabbed everything we could get our hands on, and the original lineup included eight bulbs from Philips, 
Genesis, Epapion, Ushio, Gavita, Digiloom, Nanolux, and Solistec. Sadly, that number was quickly knocked back to seven, as I broke the Solistec, trying to get it into the fixture. Please, These dirty hands. It highlighted an issue we'll get to in a little bit, but it meant it didn't make the test. So what about the surviving seven? The first thing you notice when you line them all up and before you break one of the competitors is the differences in component architecture. That is, until you start noticing several similarities. Six of the eight bulbs seem to be broken down into two distinct groups. What I call the springy ones, the Ushio, the Gavita and the Epapion, and the wire-based ones, the Solistec, the Digiloom and the Nanolux. The Genesis and the Philips had completely different designs. Whether this means they have a common design ethos, or that there are only a set number of ways to make a DEHPS bulb, is unclear. Upon closer inspection, we started finding substantial differences in length between the eight bulbs. This was first outlined in the last DEHPS test, where we noticed that some bulbs sat tighter in fixtures than others and it's natural to have some variability in anything manufactured. But when we measured the bulbs side by side, we saw up to four or five millimeters of difference, which is what killed the Solis tech. It was so tight that on the third attempt to ease it into the clip, the end tab snapped off. And this was after I mentioned the length differential in the last video. Perhaps this is an issue the manufacturers need to pay some attention to. So learn from my mistakes, pay extra special attention to fitting DEHPS bulbs, and do not force them, not even a little bit. Today we'll be recording all the usual data using our 25 sample canopy test on our 5 foot by 5 foot grid at a height of 48 inches, including our intensity maps the canopy average, and uniformity ratio, as well as the usual conditions data for each of the bulbs, except of course the ill-fated Solistec. Without doubt, the closest test I've run to date, with only incremental differences separating the top five positions. But as we've said from the beginning, we're here for the numbers, so we'll let them do the talking. And it's a good thing we are, because separating these bulbs by spectral quality is almost impossible. The Solistec bulb broke as a result of my attempts to squeeze it into a socket spring that was more than likely at least a millimetre too short for it. I don't know if this is a problem caused by the Radiant DE having short clips, or the Solistec bulb being too long. And it's not just the Solistec either, it was simply the most extreme example of the problem. Some bulbs were too short, so short, in fact, the retaining springs wouldn't hold them in place, meaning they had to be supported underneath while the clips were slid across, which isn't ideal. Perhaps some of these bulbs have been designed around a particular fixture, and that would explain the differences in length. Whatever the case, take care, as mistakes are not only costly, they can be dangerous too. Sadly, this means that the Solistec gets a DNF for this test. But moving on, it starts to get interesting. In seventh is the Nanolux, with a canopy average of 449.94 micromoles. The sixth spot has been taken by the Digiloon. It comfortably beat the Nanolux with a margin of over 23.5 micromoles. The top five bulbs are close, very close, borderline inseparable, with just 19.28 micromoles separating fifth place from first place, 
we're talking about a very narrow window within which to rank these last five bulbs, especially in a real world test such as ours. However, there has to be a winner, so here goes. Coming in fifth is the Ushio with a canopy average of 519.56 micromole. In fourth place, surprisingly enough, is the originator of DEHPS technology, the Philips Green Power, with 527.44 micromoles. In third place was the E-Papillon bulb, with second place going to the Gavita by just 0.76 of a micromole. Which means that the Genesis is the champ, with a margin of victory of just 5.12 micromoles. Putting the intensity maps side by side illustrates just how close this test is. This suggests to me that perhaps DEHPS has reached its maximum development potential. Getting significant improvements over these bulbs is possibly looking unlikely for the top players, so the real deciding factors shift to cost and longevity of the bulb. Cost is actually quite hard to quantify, as bulb prices seem to vary more than gas seemingly. And longevity is also hard, because convincing the hardworking Monster Gardens team to let me burn 8 bulbs for 10,000 hours each to see how they degrade is quite a hard sell. Why? Because we're talking about $12,500 in electricity alone, and that's if I can find somewhere safe to run the test. So currently, longevity testing is a no-no on this scale but it has got me thinking for the future. That about wraps it up for this episode of Test Lab. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel so you don't miss a single test. But until next time, I'm Dr. Watt. Thanks for watching.